I'm going to be looking at Exodus chapter 18. Exodus chapter 18, what you have is a man named Jethro, Moses' father-in-law. And he's going to give Moses some advice. And it sounds like really good advice, but actually it's not good advice at all. And Jethro is obviously an older man, older than Moses. And he's the priest of Midian. He would be somebody you think would give pretty good advice. But great men aren't always wise. And in the Bible, just because somebody's older than you doesn't mean they're always going to give you the right advice. This story goes to show you that you have to go by the Lord first. And even if a person is older than you, you got to filter what they say through the Word of God. So Exodus chapter 18 It says, when Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, and that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt, then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back, and her two sons, of which the name of the one was Gershom, for he said, I've been a stranger, I've been an alien in a strange land, and the name of the other was Eliezer, for the God of my father said he was mine help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his two sons and his wife unto Moses into the wilderness, where he encamped at the mount of God. And he said unto Moses, I, thy father-in-law Jethro, and come unto thee and thy wife and her two sons with her. So here comes Jethro coming to see Moses, and he brings Zipporah, which is Moses' wife, and their two sons. And he's about to give him some bad advice. So look at verse 1 again. When Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, and that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Now look at that phrase. He heard what God had done. This shows that Moses had made people know that the good things that were going on is something that God was accomplishing and not himself. You see, in your life, when you got good things going on, you need to make it known around you that the good things going on is because of God, something God had done, not something you have done. You don't want to make it about you. You want to make sure that in all things that the Lord has the preeminence. You want to make sure that God's getting the glory in everything. So Jethro heard what God had done. You see, it's the Lord that brought you out of Egypt. It's the Lord that brought you out of the bondage of sin and the devil, the flesh, the world. It's the, you got to give God credit for that. God called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 1 Peter chapter 2. You didn't climb out of darkness yourself. You didn't save yourself from hell. It's God that brought you out. It's what God had done. It says in verse 2, Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, you know, the wife he took back there in Exodus chapter 2, after he had sent her back, and her two sons, of which the name of the one was Gershom, for he said, I've been an alien in a strange land. And her two sons, of which the name of the one was Gershom, and he said, I've been an alien in a strange land. Alien. Just as this world is in our home. Notice he named his son Gershom. I've been an alien in a strange land. You see, you are an alien in a strange land. This world's not your home. You know, you, the song, this world's not my home, I'm just passing through. And in Philippians chapter 3, if you want to look at Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20, it says in Philippians chapter 3, 20, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, 
who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. You see, our conversation is in heaven. This place we're in right now is a strange land to us. We're aliens here. And when you got saved, Ephesians chapter 2 talks about how he made you sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Spiritually speaking, you're already in heaven. You're just waiting on your body to be. You're waiting on the redemption of your body. And we're an outsider down here. This, this world's not our home at all. That's why you don't fit in. If you're a Bible believer, you find that you just don't fit in. You're, you're so different than everybody else. You're an alien in a strange land. And Moses is an alien in a strange land himself. So he named his son Gershom. And the name of the other was Eliezer. In verse 4, Exodus 18, And the name of the other was Eliezer. For the God of my father, said he, was mine help, and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. Think about that name. His name's Eliezer. And it says, The God of my father, said he, was mine help. So we've been delivered. He said, I've been delivered from the sword of Pharaoh. Me and you've been delivered from the sword of Pharaoh. 2 Timothy 4.17 In 2 Timothy 4 and verse 17, it says, Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. You see, Paul was constantly being delivered. He was being delivered from the roaring lion that walks about seeking whom he may devour. He said, And the name of the other was Eliezer, for the God of my father said he was mine help. The Lord is our help. Acts 26, 22. Acts 26, 22. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. Acts 26, 22. God is still helping people. God helped the Apostle Paul. God helps me and you. He's our strength. And he delivered Moses and Israel from the sword of Pharaoh. You see, Pharaoh's the type of the Antichrist. And in the tribulation, the Lord's going to deliver people from the sword of the Antichrist. Verse 5, And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife unto Moses into the wilderness, where he encamped at the mount of God. You see, Jethro had kept Moses' family during the plagues, and now he's bringing them back to Moses, and he said unto Moses, I, thy father-in-law Jethro, am come unto thee, and thy wife, and her two sons with her. And Moses went out to meet his father-in-law, and did obeisance, and kissed him. And they asked each other of their welfare, and they came into the tent. So he made obeisance to him. He bowed down to him. It's like you see this in other places, like Second uh, Samuel 1 verse 2. And it came to pass, even on the third day, that, behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul, and his clothes rent, and earth upon his head. And so it was when he came to David that, if, that he fell to the earth and did obeisance. So it has to do with the respect thing, a bowing down, not worshiping, but a bowing down, showing respect, like there in Samuel, and then in uh, Genesis seventeen three. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him. So he made obeisance there. It's, it has to do with the respect thing. And it says he made obeisance and kissed him, and they asked each other of their welfare. You see that? That's something you need to do. When you 
run into somebody, you need to ask them of their welfare. Take thought in how someone else is doing. You know, sometimes you may just say, how you doing? You don't even give time for that person to tell you how they're doing. You need to take thought in somebody else's welfare. And Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done unto Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake and the travail that had come upon them by the way and how the Lord delivered them. So here comes Jethro. Moses makes obeisance to him, kisses him. Kissing was the standard oriental salutation between friends and loved ones. I'll give you some other examples. Luke 7, 45. Luke 7, 45. It says, Thou gavest me no kiss. This is the Lord that said this. It said, Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. You see, this was part of their culture. In 1 Corinthians 16, 20, Paul says, All the brethren greet you, greet ye one another with an holy kiss. Ruth 1 9. In Ruth 1 9, it says, The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And one more, 1 Kings 19.20. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, then I will follow thee. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to thee? You see, uh, whereas we mostly just shake hands, they would kiss. And that was just part of their thing. So that's why Moses would kiss Jethro, Jethro would kiss Moses. And Jethro rejoiced, this is verse 9, and Jethro rejoiced for all the goodness which the Lord had done to Israel, whom he had delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians. You see that? A good heart will rejoice with others when they have something good happen to them. You got a lot of people, when something good happens to somebody, they're not rejoicing with them, they're mad about it and they're jealous. And they start talking about about that person and say, you know, he didn't deserve that or how come he got that and I didn't. They can't rejoice with others. Romans 12, 15 says, look at Romans 12, 15. It's a really good verse that goes, could go along with this. It says, rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. That's what Jethro's doing here. Even though Jethro gives some bad advice, He's still rejoicing in something good that happened to somebody else. And that's what we need to do. Verse 10. And Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who hath delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh, who hath delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know Notice this, now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods. For in the thing wherein they dealt proudly, he was above them. That's the best verse in this chapter, I believe. And that would be the theme of this chapter. He was above them. He, now he knows that the Lord is greater than all gods. You see, just because Mo, or Jethro is a priest didn't mean he had the right God. It seems now that he knows that the Lord is greater than all gods. And he makes this great statement, For in the thing wherein they dealt proudly, he was above them. So if I had to title this, it would be the Almighty is above. And here's some things that he's above. He's above the afflictions of Egypt. Look back at verse 1. When Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, and that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. You see, the Almighty was above Pharaoh, the Egyptians, all the bondage in Egypt, and he brought them out. 
you know, you may be a sinner listening to this, a sinner in the sense that you've never been saved, you never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. You may think that nothing can get you out of the grips of the powers of darkness and that you're just hell bound for all eternity. But God is above the afflictions of Egypt. Egypt is a picture of this sinful world that you have to walk around in every day. The Almighty is above the afflictions of this world. He's above the stronghold of this world, the flesh and the devil. And all you got to do is come to the Lord Jesus Christ and believe on Him to be your Savior. And you can be saved. And the moment that you believe on Jesus Christ, He breaks the chains off you. He makes sure that I Egypt can't hold you down anymore and you can be free in Christ. The Almighty above is above the afflictions of Egypt. It's all under His feet. The next one. The Almighty is above the arsenal of Pharaoh. In verse 4, look back at verse 4, it said, And the name of the other was Eleazar, for the God of my father said he was mine help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. The Lord was not afraid of the sword of Pharaoh. The Lord was not afraid of Pharaoh and a bunch of his mighty men coming after him in the Red Sea with their chariots and their horses. You know, some trust in horses, but we'll remember the name of the Lord our God. Some trust in chariots. We'll remember the name of the Lord our God. Some trust in these swords, but we got a sharp two-edged sword. The Word of God, Hebrews 4.12, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. We're not afraid of the arsenal of Pharaoh because the Almighty is above the arsenal of Pharaoh. We're not af afraid of the devil's devices because the, the Lord Almighty is above the devil's devices. We need to understand that the devil does have his weapons that he comes against us with. We shouldn't make a fun of them. We, we should res respect them and that... We know that we got to say, the Lord rebuke thee, like Michael the archangel did in the book of Jude. But the Lord Almighty is still above the arsenal of Pharaoh, a picture of the devil, a picture of the Antichrist. Then you see that in the verse we just said, Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods, for in the thing wherein they dealt proudly, he was above them. He is better than all other gods. That's the next one. The Almighty is above the afflictions of Egypt. He's above the arsenal of Pharaoh. And he's above all other gods. Any God that you think is a God, God's above it. Anything that's in your life that you're putting ahead of God, that's your God. But God's still above that God. That God may, above, may be above the true God in your life. And you may have that false God on the throne of your heart but God's still above that God in 1 Corinthians 15 26 it says the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death for he hath put all things under his feet when he saith all things are put under him it is manifest that he is accepted which did put all things under him all things under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Death thought he was something special, but the Lord came down there and stole his keys. The devil thought he was something special, but he destroyed him who had the power of death. One day the devil's going to be in the bottomless pit. He's going to be in the lake of fire after that and never be able to get out to bother anybody ever again. And Jethro... Moses' father-in-law, this is verse 12, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and sacrifices for God, and Aaron came and all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. So Jethro officially knows there is one true God, just as Naaman found out in 2 Kings 5.17, there's one true God. And Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 3.29 
He saw the form of the fourth was like the Son of God in the fire. He found out there is one true God. And then here in verse 12, they're eating this sacrifice before the Lord. And, but you know, before the Lord, it didn't always have to mean in front of the tabernacle because this here was before the tabernacle was put up. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses set to judge the people. And the people stood by Moses from the morning until the evening. Now we're getting close to where Jethro is going to give him the bad advice. So Moses sits down and the people come to him with these big matters, small matters, medium-sized matters. And Moses has got the answers because he's the one that's hooked up with God. And just like you today as a Christian, Peter talks about how you need to be ready to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you. You need to be ready to give an answer. You need to be so studied up and so in tune with the Word of God that pretty much no matter what anybody asks you about life or the Word of God, you can give them an answer and Bible verses to back it. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said, What is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone, and all the people stand by thee from morning unto even? So he's like, Why is it that you're the only one doing this, Moses? Why is it you're so busy that you, with all these people coming to you? And Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people came unto me to inquire of God. You see, God uses men to help you get knowledge, to help you grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Second Peter 3.13. God uses men to help you do that. Men like Moses, faithful men. Uh, Paul told Titus, you know, teach these, go out and uh, ordain faithful men that will teach others also. He tells Timothy, get some men that will be able to teach others also. Moses and Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come unto me to inquire of God. We don't have to go to a man to inquire of God today because we've got the complete Bible right in front of us. But he's given us men, pastors, teachers, evangelists for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And God is using Moses in this way. He uses Moses to get the knowledge of him to the people. And when Moses said, When they have a matter, they come unto me, and I judge between one and another. And I do make them know the statutes of God and his laws. As a Bible believer, that should be your goal, to make people know the statutes of God and his laws. You, want, you should be wanting to make them amazed with the scriptures. That should be your goal. You don't. Your goal shouldn't be to get them impressed with you. Your goal should be to get them impressed with the scriptures themselves. And see, there's even statutes and laws before Moses gets the law on Mount Sinai. You see, back there in verse 12, there was burnt offerings and sacrifices before the law was given as well and they could they could come and stand before God before the tabernacle so you see these facts like that but then here is Moses father-in-law's advice and Moses father-in-law said unto him this thing that thou doest is not good that's what Jethro said to Moses he says it's not good for you to sit in this seat and have all this many people come to you about these big matters, small matters, medium-sized matters. But it was good. You see, Moses was the type of Jesus, our mediator. Moses was acting as a mediator. Jesus is our mediator, 1 Timothy 2, 5, for there's one God and one mediator between God and me and the man Christ Jesus. Jethro's advice caused Moses to ruin the type as the one and only mediator. You see, there's one God and one mediator between God and me and the man Christ Jesus. We don't have to go to a priest 
to be our mediator. We don't have to go to anybody. We go straight to the Lord Jesus. He's our mediator. And you see, Jethro's advice caused Moses to ruin the picture of that. And Moses should have waited because he was about to give a written copy of his laws. There's about to be a written copy given of his laws to where the people could just look at the written copy. But he's going to take Jethro's bad advice. And that's another thing the Lord Almighty is above. He was above the afflictions of Egypt. He's above the arsenal of Pharaoh. He's above all other gods. And he's ab above the advice of Jethro. God is above everybody's advice. Everybody's advice is pretty much useless unless it is filtered through the scriptures and makes its way out on the other side. I've all the time got people giving me advice. Everywhere I go, they're giving me advice about something. Younger men, older men, they've always got this great advice to give me about what I should do, how I should do it. Thing is, I filter it through the Bible. I imagine the Bible as like this big machine that's always running. It never gets turned off. When somebody gives me advice, I just open the Bible up and I shove their advice in there. And if it makes it out on the other side, I'll take the advice. But most of the time, it don't make it out on the other side. The Bible just eats it up and shows you that their advice is unwise advice most times. But look at what um, Jethro says to Moses. He says, That will surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee, thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Notice, this looks like good advice. He's like, Moses, you're going to weigh yourself out. That's what people say to me about a lot of things. You're going to weigh yourself out. You're trying to do too much. And sometimes that can be true, but it's not true if you're just doing what God, you feel like God wants you to do. If you... If you're doing what you believe God wants you to do, then God's going to take care of you. He's not going to let you wear away. Jethro didn't know the future. The Lord knows the future. The Almighty is above Jethro's advice because God knows the future. Jethro does not know the future. And the thing is, Moses never did wear away. Even when he, would, when he died in Deuteronomy 34.7, look at Deuteronomy 34.7. This will show you how Moses was when he died. And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. He wasn't wore away at all. When he got up out of the bed in the morning, he didn't have to roll out of bed. He hopped up out of bed. He arose up early in the morning. Uh, when Moses was 120 years old, he could probably run a marathon. When Moses was 120 years old, he could do what you did at 20 years old. He never did wear away. Israel's shoes didn't even get old. In Deuteronomy 29.5, Deuteronomy 29.5, And I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes are not waxing old upon you, and thy shoe is not waxing old upon thy foot. God took care of them. He made sure that they didn't wear away. But, but Jethro here, he said, Moses, thou wilt surely wear away, both thou and this people that is with thee. For this thing is too heavy for thee. Yet yeah, maybe too heavy for them, but it's not too heavy for God. He's going to take care of them. He said, thou art not able to perform this thyself alone. And he said, hearken now unto my voice. I will give thee counsel. And God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to Godward, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. He said, hearken unto my voice. We can't hearken unto your voice unless we're listening to God's voice first and then we find out your voice lines up with it. He says, I will give thee counsel. But he didn't need Jethro, you see. 
Moses talks to God face to face. Why would he need the counsel of Jethro? Deuteronomy 34.10 says, And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Moses talked to God face to face. Why would he need Jethro's advice? Jethro says, And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shalt show them the way wherein they must walk, and the work that they must do. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. So it all sounds good. He's, he wants him to get some able men that fear God, and have truth, and that hate covetousness, and make them to be rulers over thousands and hundreds and fifties and tens. And that way those people can come to these able men, and those able men can become the ones that make these people know God's statutes and laws. But that ruins the top. It ruins the type of the Lord Jesus Christ as our one and only mediator because Moses was the type of, our, of Jesus Christ, our one and only mediator. And then it says in verse 22, And let them judge the people at all seasons, and it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge. So shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall be, bear the burden with thee. And that sounds good, you know, Bear ye one another's burdens, as Paul says. It sounds good. But this was Moses, a specific burden for Moses that he had to bear. Just like Jesus bears our burdens. He's our mediator. And it's, look at what he says. It shall be easier. So shall it be easier for thyself. You know, that sounds good. People always saying, you know, you need to make it easier on yourself. Work smarter, not harder. You know, you you got to help yourself. You got to look out for old number one. That's the attitude of people today. If you don't take care of you, nobody else will. You know, all these things people say to you all the time. Making it easier on yourself is only an appeal to the flesh. It sounds really good to the flesh. I mean, there are, and there are some examples where this is true, where you do need to make it easier on yourself, but not, in most cases, it's not. And notice he's, he's calling it small matters. He said you can bring the small matters to, the, the people can bring the small matters to these able men and then bring the great matters to you. But remember, it's the little foxes that spoil the vines, Song of Solomon 2.15. Those small matters will turn into great matters. And if those guys handle the small matters wrong, they turn into great matters. All of them needs to be brought to Moses. Just like if you've got a small matter, something that's a little thing, you need to take it to God first. You take it to your mediator first, the Lord Jesus Christ. Not to some great wise man. Take it to the Lord first. Even the small matters. Not just the big ones, but the small ones too. Making it easy isn't always the answer. You know, the Lord said, take up your cross and follow me. That's not an easy answer of what to do with your life. The easy answer would be, oh, you're saved. Just take it easy. But the Lord said, take up your cross and follow me. And you know, these small things are not really small things. In Luke 16, 10, the Lord talks about he that is faithful and that which is least. Don't just see small things as small things. All right, verse 23. If thou shalt do this thing and God command thee so, then thou shalt be able to endure and all this people shall also go to their place in peace. Notice he said, And God command thee so. The older man 
doesn't always give the right advice. Just like in 1 Kings 13, 16 through 18, that old man told that young prophet to come home and eat dinner with him after God had told him not to go in there and eat dinner with him. See, the old man isn't always right. As a general rule, an older man's wiser than you, and they got good advice as a general rule. But there's instances where they're not that shows you you have to filter what people say through the Bible. God does not have to speak through Jethro. Moses begins to lie, rely on Jethro too much. And when you get to Numbers 10 and verse 31, uh, Moses said to Jethro, Leave us not, I pray thee, for as much as thou knowest how we are to encamp in the wilderness, and thou mayest be to us instead of eyes. He doesn't need Jethro to be his eyes. He's got God as a pillar of fire by night, a pillar of cloud by day. He's got God guiding the way. Verse 24. So Moses hearkened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. And Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. And they judged the people at all seasons. The hard causes they brought unto Moses, but every small matter they judged themselves. So he takes Jethro's advice all the way around. And Moses' father-in-law, and Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went his way into his own land. And a lot of these so-called able men turned out to not be very able because in Numbers 16, 1 through 12, you see them try to um, take Moses off the throne and usurp their authority over him. But God chooses out some able men later in the book of Numbers. In Numbers 11, 24. And Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord and gathered the seventy men of the elders of the people and set them round about the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in the cloud and spake unto him and took of the spirit that was on him and gave it unto the seventy elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. So God will choose out certain men when it's time, but it wasn't time here. Moses took Jethro's bad advice, get some able men to judge some small matters. Some of those able men in number 16 turn out to be not so able. But the moral of the story is people can give some advice. People can give advice that sounds really good. Jethro gave some advice that sounded really good all the way around. So much so that pretty much anybody you read is going to say that Jethro's advice is very good. But he gave the wrong advice and caused Moses to ruin the type of Jesus Christ, our mediator. And it, and it ruined the type once again. But this chapter also proved the Almighty is above. The Almighty is above the afflictions of Egypt. The Almighty is above the arsenal of Pharaoh. The Almighty is above all other gods. And the Almighty is above the advice of Jethro.